Well, hello, friends. Dr. Randy Lane Butcher, pastor of Connecting Point Church and the founder of Connecting Point Communications. We're delighted you've tuned into the broadcast today as we believe we have another message that's going to be a blessing to you, the beginning possibly of at least a short series. And we're going to be talking today about the idea of emotional intelligence. I think it's going to be a blessing to you. But before we get into the teaching of the Word of God, as always, we want to remind you of the resources we have free and available for you at randylanebunch.org. Of course, that's the Connecting Point Communications website, and under the media link there, you will find an abundance of resources that will be a blessing to you. We have our magazine, blog, podcast, past editions of our television broadcast on the YouTube channel. And by the way, would you go to our YouTube channel, subscribe, like, and comment. Again, you can find it all under the media link at randylanebunch.org. In addition to that, as always, we would love to hear from you. If you've been blessed by the broadcast, received a touch from God, gotten saved, healed, touched by the power of the Lord in any way, we really want to hear from you. So please email us at info at connectingpc.org. Well, as I said, I want to talk about a subject that I've never talked about before on the broadcast, and that is this idea of emotional intelligence. And, you know, we've heard a lot uh, through the years about IQ, the intelligence quotient of an individual. And, of course, we think about people like Albert Einstein, the famed author Charles Dickens, people who were reported as having an extremely high IQ. And of course, we talk oftentimes about the accomplishments of people like that. But I think we can all agree that just having a high IQ does not ensure that you're going to be a better person. In fact, maybe some of the most evil geniuses who've ever lived had a high IQ. Some tyrants, world rulers that oppressed people have had a high IQ. It didn't necessarily make them a better person. But I don't think there's any question about the fact that if we have a high EQ, a high emotional intelligence quotient, that we're going to be a better person. And so we want to talk about emotional intelligence, particularly from the standpoint of what does it mean to be emotionally intelligent, scripturally speaking, from a biblical perspective. And so I can't think of a better passage of scripture to look at along these lines in Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 to capture at least what I intend to convey when I talk about emotional intelligence. So let's begin reading with these verses here. Verse 1 says, Therefore, if there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. You know, I, I think there's little doubt about the fact that we live in a pretty savage, and oftentimes merciless time in our world, particularly in the Western uh, cultural context in which we find ourselves. You say, what makes you say that? Social media, Facebook. Have you taken a look at what happens when you express your opinion online these days? Uh, I've seen recently, as, much, as recently as this morning, someone just expressing a thought, uh, something from their heart, and just being attacked, just vitriol. Uh, coming from people they don't know, people who don't know them, but for whatever reason just feel perfectly fine uh, with letting them know what they think about their opinions and basically degrading them and running them down. In fact, I wrote an article years ago called, um, uh, talking about being anonymous and expressing your opinion, talking about uh, the temerity of anonymity. Uh, there seems to be an unusual boldness, even a brashness, in telling people about what we think about them and their opinions because of the an uh, anonymity the internet gives us. On social media, on Facebook, on Instagram, we can say the most unkind things and get away with it because that six foot five, 275 pound fellow who could beat our brains out isn't standing in the same room with us. So we feel fine expressing negative opinions about him, his wife, his children, whereas we would never think to do that if they were standing in the same room as we are. And so there's this new temerity, this new uh, brashness, even wickedness, that we see exhibited by many people uh, because of the safety and the anonymity that being online provides. Even if your name is on your Facebook account, you live on the other side of the country, you're not really worried about them showing up on your doorstep 
to beat your brains out for being unkind. But at the same time, I think what's sad really about that, maybe more than anything else, is I've seen that same kind of vitriol expressed by Christians that are maybe opposing, for example, a different theological viewpoint than someone else. Maybe somebody makes a very profound or powerful statement, very positive statement, very uh, adamant statement about what they believe, and rather than just letting it go, or maybe even having you know a dignified dialogue uh, of civil disagreement, immediately there's this trash talking that goes on, this vitriol, this hatred, this animosity that's expressed because how dare you have a different opinion to me? Don't you know that I'm the standard bearer of all that is right? I am the divine plumb line of that which is right. And so rather than being gracious and recognizing that we maybe need to check our assumptions at the door and allowing the scriptures to maybe correct us where we're wrong, rather than doing any of that, we just immediately assume the other guy's wrong because he has a different opinion than I do. And not only that, but we figure that he deserves a great deal of acrimony because how dare he express an opinion that's different from my own. And so I think it's really important that the church learn a little bit about emotional intelligence, that we grow up, that we mature and become the type of people that Jesus has called us to be. So I want to talk about certain aspects of emotional intelligence that I think are extremely important, particularly for us as believers. Let me just go ahead and make a disclaimer right now. Every one of these proceed out of love. Uh, love is the highest, highest ethic for the Christian. And in fact, it's the only commandment that Jesus gave us was to love one another as he has loved us. In fact, let's go ahead and take a look at that commandment. In uh, John 13, verses 34 and 35, on the night of his betrayal, Jesus gave this last and, of course, greatest commandment, the only commandment that he gave to the church. And he says this in John 13, 34 and 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. Now, this might sound familiar because one time Jesus was asked, what are the greatest commandments? And you will remember that he said something to this effect. Number one, the first greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And he said, and the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. But that is not the command that Jesus gave to the New Testament church. He did not say to love our neighbor as ourselves. He said that we're to love one another as he loved us. Loving my neighbor as myself puts my, labor, my neighbor on the same priority and his interests on the same priority as my own. But when I love my brother, my neighbor, as Christ loved me, that means that I'm willing to sacrifice my own interest to promote the interests of my brother or my neighbor or my friend. And that's why in our lead scripture, for example, when we looked at Philippians chapter two, uh, it says here in verse three, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. In other words, not just looking out for yourself, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. It doesn't mean that you don't have a high opinion of yourself or that you see yourself as lacking value, but it means that we purposely, because what we, we, we recognize we're, we're all made in the likeness and image of God. Jesus died for all of us. So we need to esteem one another, not only highly, but the Bible says we're to go to the extra step and esteem others and their interests more important than our own. And he said, let each of you not only look out for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Well, that's what you're going to do if you're loving your brother the way Christ loved you. Now, I've shared what I'm about to share before, but I think it is so foundational when talking about emotional intelligence that I really couldn't teach this without going over the principle that I'm about to share with you. So go with me, if you would, to John chapter 8, verse 44. And I want to share with you what I think is maybe one of the greatest profound truths the Lord ever showed me. Uh, you know, we talk about sometimes God gave us revelation on something, and we don't mean that God gave us new revelation outside the Bible. What we mean is he gave us fresh illumination on old revelation. But I would say that of all the things God has shown me, revealed to me, that I have insight into, uh, I think this is maybe one of the most profound and important truths the Lord ever showed me. And here we read in John 8, 44, listen to what Jesus said, and he's saying this, mind you, to the, to the Jews, to the nation of Israel. <laughs> but he says to them, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. I think it's the NIV translation that says, when he speaks a lie, he speaks his own native language. I love that. But, but the Bible here says, Jesus speaking to the children of Israel, you're of your father, the devil, and the desires, the lust of your father, you want to do. And then he goes on to say, he was a murderer from the beginning. 
Now, when I read that, I, I understand that Jesus is saying, yeah, you might be the children of Abraham, but you still have a fallen nature, and your real father is the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. I understood that. But what really kind of confused me, what I, what I remember stopped me kind of in my Bible reading tracks, if you will, was this phrase where he said, he was a murderer from the beginning. Two characteristics Jesus identifies about the devil. Number one, he does not abide in the truth, no truth in him. The, the other thing is he's a murderer. And the Bible said he was a murderer from the beginning. And I'm, I'm thinking about that because we, I know that the devil, the, the, the fallen being, the fallen angel that we call the devil, predates the creation uh, of the world. So when we talk about the beginning, we're talking about something that goes beyond, or at least in my mind, I thought it went beyond the creation event. So when I was trying to think of it in that context, I was thinking, well, what beginning? How was he a murderer from the beginning? I don't think he murdered angels. They don't die. They're spirit beings. So what does this mean? He's a murderer from the beginning. So lacking a proper context, I really did not know what this verse meant. But if we're patient and allow the Holy Spirit to teach us, the Bible will interpret the Bible for us. And so I'll never forget, I was reading through 1 John. Now, I was reading out of the Gospel of John just then, but John also wrote three epistles that bear his name, as well as the book of Revelation. So he's responsible for four New Testament books. And in 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 through 15, I believe we find the answer to the question, what beginning? He was a murderer from the beginning. What beginning? Well, the beginning of human history. Notice this in 1 John chapter 3, beginning with verse 11. John says, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So again, going back to verse 11, uh, we're to love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, talking about the devil, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own works were evil and his brothers were righteous. In other words, his brother's righteous works showed up, uh, Cain's evil works or his lack of good works. And God began to give me insight into the nature of sin versus the new creation nature of love. The nature of sin, if you were to ask me, what's one word that, that really I guess, defines the fallen nature, I would say self or selfishness, but self will work for now. And the, the nature of self is to promote self and self-interests, even at the expense of another. The ultimate expression of that is murder. And that's exactly what Cain did. He murders, murdered his brother uh, to promote his own interest and to keep his own motives from being shown up as being less than that of Abel. And so he murdered his brother to promote his own interests. And you know, you would think, man, that's, that's, that's an amazingly ridiculous, exaggerated expression of, of the sin nature. But no, it's not. You think about it today. There was that, uh, I want to say her name, was, I don't want to even say the name because I might get it wrong and be talking about somebody else. But there was a woman some years back, she came up for parole and was denied parole. But I remember when the crime happened, she drowned her two children in the back of, I want to say it was like a station wagon. She backed the thing into a lake and drowned her two infant or toddler children because the man she was engaged to decided he didn't want to be engaged anymore because she had kids. And so she made it sound like, oh my gosh, I don't know where my kids are, you know, whatever. And, and of course, when the accident happened, when the kids were found, it was a mistake. It was an accident. I don't remember all the details, but I remember it came out that she had murdered her own children simply because she wanted to be able to marry this guy. So what did she do? She murdered another to promote her own interests over the interests of her own children. And we think, how could somebody do something like that? But friend, this happens in the world more than we would like to think it does. But this is the fallen sin nature. The fallen sin nature always seeks to promote self and self-interest at the expense of another, even if it means murdering them. Sometimes it may not be physical murder. It might be character assassination. We try to run someone in the ground so that others think better of us than they do of the individual that maybe we're having an argument with or in conflict with. Friend, this happens all the time in divorces. This happens all the time on jobs where somebody wants a promotion over someone else. Uh, there's all this kind of murder going on. And, and envy is a kind of murder, the Bible says. If I want what you've got, if I'm jealous of what you've got, then that's kind of even the seed of murder in my heart. And the Bible said, anyone that has murder in his heart doesn't have eternal life abiding in him. Why? Because the nature of the life of God, of eternal life, 
is love. And so by contrast, we see the love of God expressed in the person of Jesus Christ. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to look at verses 1 and 2. And notice how who we're to imitate. We're not to imitate Cain. <laughs> it said we're to love one another, not as Cain, so we're not to imitate him. But notice who we are to imitate. Uh, Ephesians 5 verses 1 and 2. Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us, and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God, for a sweet smelling aroma. Beautiful contrast to the sin and self nature is Jesus, the selfless son of God who gave himself. What does love do by contrast? Love always seeks to promote the interests of others even at its own expense. The ultimate expression of that is to lay down one's life for another, which is exactly what Jesus did for us. The Bible said greater love has no man than to lay down his life for another. That's exactly what Jesus did for us. And likewise, that's what we're to do for one another. We're to put the interests of others before ourselves. And in a way, anytime we do that, we're laying down our lives for them. In fact, notice what he goes on to say in 1 John chapter 3. We'll pick it up with verse 16. He says, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whosoever has this world's goods and see his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. In other words, we've got to be willing to be inconvenienced. We've got to be willing to set our own interests aside. We've got to be willing to prefer our brother and go the extra mile to see to it that his needs are met, that we're being conscious of and careful to treat others the way we would want to be treated, but even more so to treat them like Christ has treated us, which again means putting their interests before our own. So if we were going to talk about, which we are, if we're talking about emotional intelligence, what is the first and foremost characteristic of emotional, emotional intelligence, Randy, as far as you can see it? Well, there's no doubt in my mind the number one primary characteristic of emotional intelligence that we need to get a hold of in the church today is selflessness. We've got to learn to put others first. We've got to, be, we've got to quit being so concerned about how we look, how we're coming off. You know, when it comes to ministry, for example, today uh, I think we have this horrible um, contagion in the church called celebrity. And it's not something that should be in the church. If you look at the, the apostle Paul and Peter and the... In fact, Paul addressed this really in 1 Corinthians 1. We won't look at it for time's sake. But remember, he said, you know, some of you, you said Christ isn't divided. He said some of you are saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, uh, I'm of Christ. He said, is Christ divided? Did Paul, what was I crucified for you? And so we have this horrible celebrity status uh, of certain ministers or ministries or, you know, worship groups or even Christian bands in the church. And you've got people that adore these people and practically worship them. And friend, these are just servants for your sake. They're not to be idolized. They're not to be put on a pedestal. They're, they we're to understand that they're to be honored for their work's sake, but they're just people. And they will disappoint you like people do if you put them on some kind of pedestal. Even if they don't fall morally or have some kind of crash, they're going to let you down because they're not going to be perfect. They're not Jesus. So we don't worship people. And when it comes to ministry, our goal is not to try to build our little kingdom, to build our name or build our brand, as we put it today. I think that should be anathema to any of us, this idea, I'm going to build my brand. No, we're going to build the kingdom. This is not about you. This is not about me. This is not about our personal aggrandizement and having some kind of name for ourselves. This is about lifting up the name of Jesus and meeting the needs of those whom God has put under our care. And, and if we're to serve God acceptably, we've got to get ourselves out of the way. It's not about us. It's not about how we look. In fact, you know, oftentimes we ought to do things that nobody ever knows about. Just acts of kindness, acts of goodwill toward others that just simply we do because the nature of Christ compels us to love others more than we love ourselves. You know, it's interesting to me, going back to Philippians chapter 2, you know, you could read those <laughs> verses, Philippians 2, verses 1 through 4 again and again and again, and they would never cease to get old as far as I'm concerned. But I'll never forget that I was looking at this chapter one time. Philippians uh, chapter 2 is a beautiful, the whole passage really uh, is beautiful where, it's, uh, where this is concerned. Uh, but but I, was, I noticed in verse 19, beginning there in Philippians 2, beginning with verse 19, Paul talks about his care for them and how though he can't be there, he wants to send someone to them 
to take care of them, to see to their needs. And listen to what he says here. Again, this is Philippians 2, beginning with verse 19. He says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. I remember reading this and was floored. Paul says, I'm, I want to send someone to you, and I'm going to send my spiritual son Timothy to you, because really, it's really hard to find anybody who will put your, own, your interests before his own. He said, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. Friend, I'm telling you, it's sad when even in the ministry, Paul says, it's hard to find anybody who will get past their own needs, their own interests, and prefer the interests of those whom they're called to serve over their own. And yet Timothy, obviously, uh, this true son of the faith, was one of these individuals who was willing to set aside his own need, his own interests, and put the needs of others before himself. There's no doubt in my mind that maybe one of the chief characteristics of emotional intelligence that the church needs to get a hold of today is selflessness. This willingness to put the needs of others before our own. If we would put selflessness at, at a, at, as a premium, a premium in our life, and put the interests of others before our own, there's a lot of things we wouldn't say. There's a lot of things we wouldn't do. Selflessness will be a great preventative for putting our foot in our mouth and saying things we ought not. Uh, a lack of kindness that we see that's so proliferating in much of our online conversations would go away if we chose to be selfless people and imitate Christ and always ask, how can I advance the interests of this individual with whom I'm engaging? You know, it would be better not to engage at all than to do damage uh, to those who are in the church of Jesus Christ simply because you feel I've got to let my opinion be heard. Because oftentimes it's more about us and our opinions than it is genuinely about helping other people. And I think if we would only engage in those things where we know by doing so, I can better the lives, improve the lives, encourage the lives of those to whom I'm going to minister. If we would use that criteria as a filter, there'd be a lot of things we wouldn't do because we wouldn't be concerned about promoting ourselves. We wouldn't be consider, concerned about building our brand. We would be concerned about ministering to the needs of those under our charge, putting their interests before our own. Listen, if we will do that selflessly, God will give us favor. God will open doors. God will take care of all the things we're trying to do by building our brand if we'll just put others before ourselves and serve them selflessly. If you think about it through history, not just in the church, but even just in secular history, think about the founding generation. What made individuals like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and John Adams and, and all these people that we think of as you know such great heroes uh, of, of the early founding of our nation, of course, today with political correctness and cancel culture. They're, they're, they're trying to, you know, incriminate these men and make them less than what they are. But if you look at the sacrifices that founding generation made, what made them special was their selflessness. John, uh, I'm sorry, George Washington was easily the wealthiest man in, in, the, in the colonies. Uh, he didn't have to become president. He didn't have to preside over the Constitutional Convention. He didn't need to do any of these things for himself, but he felt the call of duty for his countrymen. And when Madison came to Washington and said, listen, if you're not the president of the Constitutional Convention, I don't believe we're going to be able to make this you know, these colonies a United Nation. I believe that they're going to be fra you know, fractured and fragmented, only looking to their own interests. And really, that's what made our nation great, was the, the states were willing to look past their own immediate interests, or the colonies, past their own immediate interests to what was better for the whole. And that's what made our founding uh, generation so great, was they were willing to set aside their own interests for the interests of the greater good. When we talk about those who went to war in World War II, here in America, we call them the greatest generation. Why? Because they were willing to sacrifice their own freedoms, their own families, their own uh, futures, for the sake of a greater cause to defeat uh, National Socialism and Nazism. And so anytime we look back in history at people who made a significant contribution, whom we respect and admire, it almost always comes down to the fact that they were people that were willing to set aside their own interests to promote the interests of the majority or the interests of others. And when we, when we think about Jesus, of course, the greatest example of selflessness ever. Uh, Jesus put the interests of the whole world before himself. We all like sheep have gone astray. 
uh, we've gone everyone to his own way, and yet the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Bible said there might be some who would perish for a righteous man, but the Bible said God loved us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 8, uh, Romans 5, 8. So I want to ask you today, have you embraced Jesus Christ? He made a selfless sacrifice for you. I don't know if you know him. I don't know if you've come to faith. I don't know if you've received Jesus as Lord and Savior. But friend, let me just assure you, you're never going to find anybody who loves you like Jesus. Jesus loved you enough that he laid down his own life. Not only laid down his life, but died the horrible death of the cross, suffering the shame, suffering and enduring the pain, the alienation from the Father he experienced when he bore sin on our behalf. Again, we all like sheep have gone astray. We've gone each one to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Um, Isaiah 53, 6 says, Jesus bore your sin and mine, took our place in death, that he might balance the scales of divine justice on our behalf. If you don't know Jesus, you don't know the one who loves you most. So why don't you right now make a decision? I'm going to invite love into my life because God is love. And when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, not only do you receive the love of the Father, but the love of the Father is poured out in your heart and then you can have the capacity to love others likewise. We're going to continue to talk about emotional intelligence. We're going to talk about other aspects of it besides selflessness. We're going to talk at least about two other kinds of, two other aspects of um, emotional intelligence. But it starts right here. Until you have the love of God in your heart, friend, you cannot exhibit true emotional intelligence. You can't grow beyond a certain point because you can't have that selflessness of heart that's necessary to be the kind of person that history will remember. So I want to ask you, do you know Jesus? Have you let love into your life? If you haven't, why don't you pray this prayer with me right now? Just say it out loud. Just say this. Dear Jesus, I believe you died for me to pay the penalty for my sins. Jesus, forgive me. Wash me clean. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Take over management of my life. Be my Lord and Savior. Jesus, I receive you now. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Friend, if you prayed that prayer and meant it, I want to hear from you. Email me at info at connectingpc.org. I'd love to hear your testimony of how you surrendered your heart to Christ and gave him your heart and let the love of God come into your life. But I want to pray for you. Perhaps you have a physical need today. Perhaps you have a financial, marital need. I don't know. But I know God will meet your need. Let's go ahead and reach out to him in faith and trust him to touch lives today. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much uh, that you love us so much. That Jesus died to demonstrate that love. And not only that, but on a practical level, you help us day by day. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, whom you've given to be a teacher, a guide, a help in times of trouble and need. And so, Father, right now, I ask for you to extend your healing hand to those wherever in the world are watching this broadcast. Lord, may they be healed. May they be touched. May they be changed. May the power of God uh, affect their physical bodies. We thank you, Father God, for healing people of, of brain cancer. We thank you, Father God, for causing tumors to disappear. We thank you, Father God, for eyesight and hearing being restored. We thank you for pain, leaving bodies, Father, heart symptoms, pains in the chest. We thank you, Father, for them disappearing now. Thank you for restoring and making whole their heart. Thank you, Father, for healing their heart and making it whole, not only physically, but, Father God, those that are downtrodden, depressed, Father God, struggling emotionally, we thank you for restoring their soul in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for healing finances. Thank you, Father God, that you're still our Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. I pray you would open up the windows of heaven to provide supernaturally for those who have a need in their life. Thank you, Father, for causing their needs to be met. Thank you, Lord God, for being our Jehovah our Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider, and above all, Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. We thank you that through Jesus, we're justified. We thank you for extending your healing hand and power on behalf of those watching the broadcast today. We give you thanks and praise for it, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, friend, we're so delighted you tuned into the broadcast today, but I want to encourage you, go to the website, randylanebunch.org. If you haven't gone there, go there and look under the media link. You will find a plethora of resources free and available for you, literally hundreds and hundreds of hours of resources to teach you, feed you, minister to your life. It will be a great blessing to you if you do. Well, join us next time for the second part of this series on emotional intelligence. We believe it will be a great blessing to you. God bless you, and we'll see you next time on Connecting Point.
Thank you.